Part two of I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon by Richard Sabia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Captain Aronson, the company commander, faced two of his lieutenants. You're not telling me anything new, he said wearily. I know all about whims. I've tried everything to get him discharged, honorably and otherwise. I've spent a lot of time setting things up so he could hardly help but foul up, and we could bounce him, but what happens? Everybody else fouls up, and he stays clean. As if that isn't enough to worry about, headquarters has notified me that General Harmon B. Fife of the General Staff will come down from Washington tomorrow for a tour of this post. He'll visit the bivouac area and observe the tactical exercises. As you know, gentlemen, tomorrow is the final day of the two-week bivouac for this company, which completes their sixteen-week basic training program. We'll have the usual company combat exercise, which will involve the attack, capture, and defense against counterattack of Hill 93. The same as always, said one of the lieutenants. It won't be the same as always, the captain said, banging his fist on his desk. The area of action, the battle plan, may be the same, but this time we've got General Fife as an observer and Dolliver whims as a participant, and if I can manage to squeeze the day successfully past that Scylla and Charybdis, I'll promise not to devour any more second lieutenants between meals. Sir, offered one of the lieutenants, why don't we put whims in the hospital just for tomorrow? It would be simple to arrange, say, an upset stomach. The captain looked sadly at his junior officer. It's the only hospital we have, he said. Besides, I have a better idea. I'm detaching Wims from his platoon, and will keep him with me at the company command post as a messenger, and I'll shoot the first man who attempts to use him as a messenger, or anything else. Ha! Huh, no need to worry about that, sir. Wims may have us a little shook up, but he hasn't flipped us yet. I hope we can all say that when tomorrow ends, the captain said fervently. The company command post had been set up under a cluster of dispirited pines, obviously suffering from tired sap, but in spite of the ragged shade they provided against the mild mid-morning sun, Captain Aronson was perspiring excessively and becoming increasingly unsettled. He glanced uneasily over at the somewhat planetary bulk of General Fife, surrounded by his satellite colonels and other aides, and muttered to his lieutenant, If old Brass Bottom came down here to observe the exercise, then why the devil doesn't he go over to the hill and observe instead of hanging around here like a sword of Demosthenes? I think you mean Damocles, Captain, the lieutenant corrected. Demosthenes was the orator. Aronson looked sourly at the lieutenant. I know what I'm talking about. Fife has only to say the word and off come our heads. The lieutenant lowered his voice. I don't like the way he keeps looking at whims. Do you think he's heard about him? In Washington? You know how rumors travel in the army. Rumors, yes, the captain said. But the truth can't even limp out of the orderly room. He wiped his brow and shot a venomous glance at Wims. He said to the lieutenant, I don't like Wims sitting there in full view of the general. Go tell him to take his comic book and sit on the other side of the tree. At that moment one of the young trainees stumbled into the headquarters area, bleeding profusely from a deep gash on his cheek. Between lung-tearing gasps he told how the machine gun, intended to serve as the base of fire for the attacking platoons, had been captured by a red patrol before it could be set up. They were being let off under the supervision of a referee when he tumbled into a ravine, and in the confusion made good his escape. "'Get the jeep and rush this man to the hospital,' the captain instructed the lieutenant. "'What about the attack?' the lieutenant inquired. "'Someone will have to get word to the forward platoons to hold up until we can move up a new gun.' "'I'll send a messenger. "'But they're all out. "'One of them is bound to return soon. "'If not, I'll—' 
What is the matter with that man sulking behind that tree? boomed General Fife, who had been listening since the trainee had blurted his story. The lieutenant snatched the bleeding recruit's arm and bolted for the jeep. Hey, lieutenant, take it easy, the trainee complained. You're pulling my arm off. Ignoring him, the lieutenant was absorbed in desperate calculation. The base hospital is about twelve miles from here, he muttered as they ran. We should be safe enough there. But, General, the captain was protesting, that man is the company's snafu. He means well, but he was designed by nature to foul things up. I won't buy that, Captain, the General said forcibly. If a man has the right attitude and still doesn't measure up, then it's the fault of the people who are training him. There was a mark of menace in the general's voice as he said, Do you read me? Like the handwriting on the wall, the captain said resignedly. He glanced at the tree behind which he knew Doom sat reading a comic book. Give the man a chance to redeem himself, and I'm certain he'll come through with flying colors. I'll give you the opportunity to prove it to yourself. The general turned and bellowed at the tree, Soldier, yo! Private Wims, come over here. Wims scurried over to the general and snapped a salute. The general flicked his hand in return. Wims, your commanding officer has an important mission for you. Wims turned to his captain, his face alight. He braced and saluted smartly. Wims, the captain said, I want you to take a message to the lieutenant in command of the 1st, 3rd, and 4th platoons now in the jump-off area. Do you understand so far? Wims nodded. Tell the lieutenant there's been a delay in the attack plan. He's not to move out until he sees a white signal flare fired from the spur of woods on his left. Have you got that? Wims nodded emphatically. Yes, sir. Repeat the message. I'm to tell the lieutenant there's been a change in plans, and he's not supposed to move until a white flare is shot out of the woods on his left flank. The captain exploded. Delay, not change. And I didn't say anything about a left flank. The woods on his left flank and the spur of the woods on his left that stick out a hundred yards beyond his present position are two different things. So help me, Wims, if you get this message fouled up. I'll use you as a dummy for bayonet practice. Wims squirmed unhappily. Couldn't you write it down, sir? Why, so you can get captured and... The general interposed. Even if the message is a bit garbled, the intent should be obvious to the lieutenant if he has any intelligence. The captain regarded the general balefully, and then snapped at Wims. What are you waiting for? Move out. On the double. Wims trotted away, and as soon as he was out of sight, the general said abruptly to Aronson, I'm going over to the red lines and watch your blue attack from there. Sure, the captain snarled inwardly. Now that he's set the fuse, he's running for the hills. The general climbed into his command car and waited while one of his majors dashed into the woods along the path that led to the attack group's staging area. Less than a minute later, he returned, followed by a colonel. They jumped into the command car, which roared off immediately. As the captain was trying to puzzle out the incident's meaning, Three of his runners came out of the woods along the same path. "'Where have you gold bricks been? You should have been back long ago.' "'Sir,' one of them spoke up, "'there was a colonel a little way back there wouldn't let us pass. Said the general was having a secret conference and for us to wait.' The captain tucked away the strange information for a later consideration. Right now there was no time to be lost. "'You!' Get over to the attack group and tell the lieutenant in command to hold up until a white flare is fired from the spur of woods on his left. All other orders remain the same. If Wims has already been there, the lieutenant is to disregard any message Wims might have given him. If you see Wims, tell him to get back here. All right, move out. You. Get over to the second platoon in the reserve area and tell them to rush a replacement machine gun with support riflemen to the tip of the spur. Base of fire to be maintained twenty minutes. Signal end to firing with white flare. 
The captain dispatched his last runner with additional tactical revisions, and then took time to consider the odd fact that the general had one of his colonels delay his messengers. Was he only testing his ability to improvise? Yet he seemed unduly anxious to have him use whims. Why? Suddenly, into his mind flashed the scene of the general calling whims from behind the tree, and he knew what it was that had been screaming for attention at the back of his mind these last hectic minutes. No one had mentioned Wim's name within earshot of the general, and yet Fife had called Wim's by name. Wim's had not been included in the company briefing, and he wished he had had the courage to ask the captain where the jump-off area was, but the captain had been so angry with him he had not wanted to provoke him further. After a while of wondering, he came upon two of his own company's flank pickets nestled in a deadfall a short distance beyond the edge of the woods. They greeted him with hearty hostility. "'Get out of here, Wims. You ain't got no business here. But I'm looking for the lieutenant. I got a message for him from the captain.' "'He's over there on that hill,' one of them replied, spitefully indicating the hill occupied by the Red Force. "'Thanks.' Wim said gratefully, and in all innocence headed for the enemy hill. He lost his bearings in the woods, and when he finally came upon the hill he had made a wide swing around the left flank, and was approaching its rear slope. Immediately he was spotted by several trainees of the defending force foxholed on the lower slope. Since he came so openly from the rear area, and alone, they assumed he was one of their own men. As they let him come within challenging distance, they saw, pinned to his tunic, the green cardboard bar that identified him as a messenger. The bars were worn so that non-coms wouldn't be snatching for other duties, messengers idling between missions. As had always been done, both sides in this exercise were using the same device to identify their messengers, never expecting them to be delivering messages behind enemy lines. The challenged whims explained his mission, and he was passed through with the information that most of the junior officers were on the forward slope. Whims climbed up the hill, inconspicuous among others scurrying about on various missions, many of whom did not wear the identifying red armband of the defenders. He reached the crown of the wooded hill without finding a second lieutenant who was not a referee. He had almost reached the bottom of the forward slope, when a small bush jumped up and yelled, "'Hey, jerk, why don't you watch where you're going?' Wims pulled back just in time to avoid falling into a well-camouflaged machine-gun nest. One of the foliage-covered gunners, thinking Wims was about to topple on him, jumped aside. His ankle twisted under him, and he fell, catching the barrel of the machine-gun just under the edge of his helmet, and sagging into unconsciousness. A platoon sergeant heard the steely clatter and rushed over. That's funny, he growled ominously. I could have sworn I set up a machine gun emplacement here, but it's making noises like a boiler factory. The assistant gunner pointed to the unconscious gunner. He fell and hit his head. He's breathing, but he ain't moving. The chattering of a machine-gun from the woods opposite the hill was noted by the sergeant, and he knew the blues would be coming soon. He turned to the gunner. "'Get up the hill and snag one of our loonies or our referee. Tell him we got a man hurt here. Needs looking at.' The gunner dashed off, and the sergeant jerked his thumb at Wims. "'You, get on that gun.' "'But I got an important message for the lieutenant,' Wims protested. The sergeant, annoyed, glanced at the green bar. What lieutenant? Uh, the captain said the lieutenant in charge. Give me the message, I'll tell him. Wims started to protest, but the sergeant's eyes crackled. Well, the captain said for the lieutenant not to move out till he saw the Watt flare fired out of the woods on his left. Not to move out? the sergeant echoed doubtfully. That don't sound right. Are you sure he didn't say not to fire until we saw the white flare? "'Maybe that's it,' Wim said agreeably. "'Maybe,' the sergeant roared. "'What do you mean, maybe?' 
He grabbed Wims by the collar and pushed his face against the boys as if he were about to devour him. Is it yes or no? E yes Wims agreed nervously. What's your name, soldier? the sergeant asked. Dolliver Wims? You don't happen to be a general, do you? Wims looked confused. No, he ventured. Well, then say so, the sergeant screamed. I'm not a general, Wims said, desperately trying to please. Are you trying to get wise with me? What is your rank? Private. Now, what's your name, soldier? Wims finally understood. Private Wims, Dolliver. That's better. The sergeant's eyes narrowed as he searched his memory. I don't remember seeing you round this company before. I don't recall seeing you round here either, Wims said in suicidal innocence. You're getting wise with me, the sergeant roared. I'll take care of you later. He thrust Wims into the pit with the machine gun. Now stay there on that gun till I get back. I'm going to find the lieutenant. Wims squatted behind the gun, squinting experimentally through the sights and swinging the barrel to and fro. The sergeant returned shortly with the lieutenant. That's him, he said, pointing to Wims. The sergeant glanced at the green bar. Are you sure you got that message straight? Wims looked at the menacing sergeant. Yes, sir, he said, swallowing. Somebody is crazy, the lieutenant muttered. Sergeant, tell Lieutenant Haas to cover my platoon. I'm going back to the CP to see Captain Blair about this message. I'll try to be back before the attack starts to either confirm or cancel the order. But if not, Haas is to hold his fire until he spots the white flare, or the blues are right on top of us. Whichever happens first. The lieutenant hustled up the hill, and the sergeant went off to find Lieutenant Haas, leaving Wims alone with the machine gun and the still unconscious gunner. The distant machine gun firing had stopped, and the white smoke of a screen laid down by the blue attackers started scudding thickly across the face of the hill, hiding them as they charged. Pickets are back, the sergeant yelled at Lieutenant Haas. The blues have crossed the road and are in the gully at the bottom of the hill. How the devil can I possibly see a signal flare through these trees and all this smoke? Haas muttered to the sergeant. I think we've got a first-class snafu. Let's go check the machine gun position, if it's still there. A whistle sounded, and the blue company surged up out of the ditch and swarmed up the hill. As had been ordered, not a defending shot had yet been fired. Wims opened the breech of the machine gun to see if the ammunition belt was properly engaged. He had a difficult time forcing it open, and when he succeeded he found the webbing twisted and a couple of cartridges jammed in at impossible angles. As he was trying to clear it, the unconscious gunner revived, glanced at the advancing blues, and made for the gun which Wibbs had already commenced to take apart. "'What are you doing?' the gunner yelled. He pushed Wims aside, causing him to release his hold on the powerful spring. The bolt shot out of the back of the gun and struck the approaching Lieutenant Haas above the left ear, just as he was opening his mouth to give the order to return fire. He fell to the ground with the command unspoken, and the sergeant knelt to his aid. At the same moment, Wims recognized some members of his platoon charging up the hill, and realized for the first time he was behind enemy lines. In sheer embarrassment, he slunk away, hoping none of his comrades would notice. The lieutenant, who had gone to confirm Wims's message, now came running down the hill, shouting at his men to return fire. He had his captain with a lieutenant aide in tow, and when they reached the machine-gun nest and the fallen Haas, the lieutenant looked for Wims. I tell you he was here, the lieutenant said. The gunner and the sergeant can bear me out. And I tell you, the captain said excitedly, I did not issue any such bird-brained order. A lieutenant referee tapped the captain on the shoulder. Sir, would you gentlemen please leave the field? he said, indicating the lieutenant, the captain, and his aide, the sergeant, the gunner, and the unconscious Haas. You are all dead. 
the captain looked around to discover that their little group was the target of blank fire of several advancing blue infantrymen. "'But we're trying to straighten out a mix-up here,' the captain protested. "'I'm sorry, sir, but you're all standing here gossiping in the middle of a battle. Theoretically, you are all Swiss cheese. Please leave the area.' "'We won't leave the area,' the captain shouted. "'I'm trying to tell you we wouldn't be dead if some idiot had gotten in here and bollocked up this training exercise and—' It was a brilliant demonstration of infiltration and diversionary tactics by Dolliver Wims, said General Fife, striding forward. The captain rolled his eyes heavenward in supplication before turning to face the general. Sir, he inquired acidly, what are Dolliver Wims? Private Wims is the embodiment of the initiative and resourcefulness we are trying to inculcate in all our soldiers. I observed the entire operation, and he has demonstrated a great potential for leadership. Fife hesitated, and for a moment a shadow of repugnance darkened his features, as if, for purposes of camouflage, he were about to perform the necessary but distasteful task of smearing mud over his crisp, shining uniform. I am recommending private whims for a battlefield commission. A battlefield commission during a training exercise? The captain screeched incredulously. Fife looked at him severely. Captain, if you are unable to communicate except in those high tones, I would suggest a visit to the base hospital for some hormones. The general paused and looked around. It seems, Captain, you've lost the hill. He glanced at his watch. And in record time, too. Sir! the captain said. I won't accept that. This is a limited training exercise conducted without benefit of full communications, weapons, or elaborate tactics. Blue Company had no right to send a man behind our lines to— Captain, Fife said with annoyance, you are the most argumentative corpse I have ever encountered. I'm leaving now to get that recommendation off to Washington. In the meantime, have someone tell Captain Aronson to see that Wims is not assassinated before we get his lieutenancy. End of Part 2